on the evening of January 14th, 2011. A man is going up to his two-room studio. He is Mr. Beck, who is on his honeymoon. Mr. Beck was a resident of a famous medical school with pediatrics for about four years. On this day, he left the house at 6.45 a.m., which was a little earlier than usual. After 11 hours later, at around 5 p.m., he was on the way home. While on the elevator, he was looking at the mirror and checking at his face. It was January 14th, a freezing day, so his clothes were a little bit thick. At that time, he was thinking of taking a professional exam and enlisting. To get the qualification as army surgeon, he must have passed the specialist test in South Korea. In the US, it's USMLE Step 1, the United States Medical Licensing Examination Step 1, so he was preparing for that. Originally, the Step 1 test itself was said to have a very high pass rate, over 90%. However, the pass rate fell to 50% in 2011. Back's psychological state is that the first examination of a specialist is so tricky that he will not qualify as an army surgeon if he falls. But Mr. Back certainly had good things as well as that. He was newly married to his wife, Pac, and she gave birth in three weeks. Back went in and called his wife Pac, but she did not reply. On the screen, you can see the actual floor plan of that house. After entering the front door, looking for his wife, he entered the bedroom side of the master bedroom. And after that, when he turned on the light in the master bathroom, he saw a horrible scene there. His wife, Pac, was there, found dead. Now, I need you to focus on the sequence with the situation. As soon as Mr. Back finds his wife's death in the bathroom, first, he calls his mother-in-law. And he said such things as, my wife fell in the bathtub, and it seems like she is dead. After that call, he called 911 and said, I'm a doctor. I think my wife is dead. It seems like it's been a while since she died. Send me an ambulance. And after some time, he called 911 again and asked for the police. Around 5.13 p.m., the ambulance and the police were both dispatched to the house. But all investigations must be started from the outside. The police first checked whether there is any sign of a break-in. Is there any space outside that you can access from outside? However, this two-room studio cannot be accessed from outside of the building. As you may know, some studios have windows that open wide, but this is where the windows open only a little. I will show you the picture. A man couldn't sneak in. There was no sign of a break-in here. There were no signs of damaging the front door or forced to open it. Her husband, Mr. Back, entered the password to get into his house. Then it's a closed room. Only the story of someone breaking inside, killing the madam, and going outside is possible. There was no sign of fight or intrusion. If so, it has been confirmed that it's not related to a robbery or sex crime. What was very odd was that the victim was found in the bathroom in the master bedroom, a closed room. Cases related to closed room are mostly acquaintances of the victim, so it would be best to judge that the perpetrator could come into the house at any time. This picture is a reenactment of the victim's body pose. Half is out, and the upper half is inside the bathtub, but as you know, the studio has a smaller structure than a house or apartment. Therefore, the bathtub was also small in size. Keep that in mind, that her neck is folded too much. It was Mr. Back's wife, Pac. She was 155 centimeters tall at the age of her late 20s. She was wearing pajamas with no makeup face. Also, she was lying across the bathtub and her head was tilted. Also, she was not wearing her lens. She will give birth to her child after three weeks, but when she died, the baby passed away with her. These are the sketch of the crime scene. When you hear this sketch, did you notice something is weird? 
First of all, when we first look at the problem related to the cause of death, it is not a sex crime, and there is no sign of a break-in. These days, there are many security devices in studios. If someone tries to sneak in, he will get caught on one of the surveillance cameras, and when someone presses the intercom, everything is recorded. But according to the monitoring station, no one went to their front door. It's more reasonable to think as someone knows the password, presses the password, enters, and committed the crime. The crime occurred when the victim's husband was away from home. Then, when we divide it up, one, if someone entered the front door password and committed the crime, he is an acquaintance. Two, because she was a full-term pregnant woman, she could suddenly have anemic and collapsed, and then she died in that pose. We can divide the cause of death in those two ways. So when we judge only with the crime scene, it would be fitting to see it as an accidental death. But there is circumstantial evidence that it looks like a murder case. It's what Mr. Back said on the phone and the sequence of the phone calls he made. This is weird. As soon as Mr. Back saw his wife's body, he called his mother-in-law and said, I think my wife fell into the bathtub and died. Of course, it's not a transcript, but because it's a mother-in-law's statement, we need to doubt that her statement could be distorted. However, it may seem that he was aware of his wife's death before you even look closely and check her pulse, heartbeat, and whether she's still breathing. Generally speaking, when a husband gets home and sees his wife in the bathtub with that pose, it is very difficult to judge right away that she is dead. For example, if her head was injured, she was bleeding a tremendous amount of blood and not breathing then maybe he will accept her death. But everyone, Mr. Beck is a doctor. If he saw his wife like that, he could approach her and check her status as a doctor. If she's not moving, do CPR or take emergency measures. That's what he should have done. Then some of you say, because this could be a murder case, he didn't do anything to preserve the crime scene. Yes, you are also correct. But I doubt that a husband just looks at his wife like that and makes such a cold judgment. Is that possible? This is the first doubtful point, and now the second doubtful point. There is one behavior that I do not understand when Mr. Back judged rationally, even after his wife's death. If he was cool-headed and rational, as a doctor, he made an incomprehensible judgment that we cannot understand. Fetus. His baby. In fact, even if the mother dies, the child does not die immediately. In other words, the fetus, the baby, clearly can be alive. And this man, who is a doctor, has no way to immediately check the fetus's survival. He did not do anything about it. For instance, take out the fetus or urgently call 911, or call his obstetrician colleague for emergency measures. But he didn't do anything. That is the problem. If he was so rational at that moment, why did he not think about his child? It doesn't make sense at all. And his 911 call was also bizarre. He called 911 and requested an ambulance. And then he called 911 again and asked for the police. Requesting an ambulance would mean transfer his wife quickly to the emergency room. What about the part that he called 911 again? and requested police. When we usually report to 911, we think there is some kind of criminal activity. Then we can rationally think that at least Mr. Beck, the husband, was aware of this situation as criminal activity. Call 911, and asking for an ambulance is to save someone hurt. Then if Mr. Beck judged that his wife is dead, an ambulance is not essential, but he should request the police first Considering this part, it's weird that he asked for an ambulance first and then asked the officer. And above all, in all these circumstances, we can judge his actions. As a doctor, he acted as if he knew that his wife and baby are all dead. Of course, as he was thinking rationally, he could keep the crime scene untouched, but he clearly has actions that do not look like he is thinking rationally. So that is what we are thinking about. 
I've said this from the beginning, about the husband's planning. Was it accidental, or was it planned? What we should continue to think about, from now on, is the part of how much this person thought and moved about this part. Now, I think we need to listen a little deeper to the husband's statement. The wife was already dead when the husband came back to home, but the crime scene was somewhat strange. Mr. Back kept saying to the policeman, I'm a doctor, and he continued to explain medical terms and said, my wife is suffering from a thyroid-related disease. Because she was full term, she had a little bit of acute anemia, so she fell after losing consciousness. She couldn't breathe because her neck was too much bent when she fell into the bathtub, so I think she died because of that. Everyone, apparently the husband, Mr. Back, is speaking in a conclusive tone, as if he had seen the death of his wife and child. The possibility of murder is wholly excluded in his words. Also, something is more strange. Everyone, when the person involved in the case makes a statement, this statement is divided into facts and emotions. But this person is telling the truth now. Is it time to tell the truth? His wife and children are now dead. Even though it's a tragedy, he is saying the facts, not erupting his emotions. In this case, Anyone will turn into dependence momentarily, and it is common to urgently ask for help from one's parents, father-in-law or mother-in-law. But now, I can't hear that at all. The police also start investigating Mr. Back as a reference as a bereaved family. The last person with the victim was the husband. The detectives are now asking him to explain the situation. Statement about all the situation with his wife happened before Mr. Beck left the house at 6.45 a.m. But the statement of the morning situation is unique. Very unique. Listen to this. After breakfast, I saw my wife in the living room, watching TV. After that, I went to the bathroom for a shower. After a shower, I thought white hoodie and black training pants are suitable for studying, so I wear them. And when I was leaving, she said, have a nice day and waved her hand in the master bedroom. That's the last I've seen her. That's 6.41 a.m. His alibi is clear. And 15 minutes later, he arrived at the hospital, where he was working as a resident doctor. There he met a nurse of his department. Mr. Back asked the nurse immediately, why did you come so early? And after that, he went to the library to study. You may know something strange about his statement, let me talk to you in an easy way. Let's assume you had dinner with your lover. If I asked you to tell me in detail about your words and behaviors on dinner last night, you would describe all the details, including conversation, how you enjoyed your meal, where you went together after dinner, acquaintances and family members at dinner. There will be very accurate statements about the situation around you. There must be a lot of interactive conversation between the two of you. What's strange is that, before the day of the incident, Mr. Back makes a detailed statement about the story he had with his wife, went to a fancy restaurant on the evening of January 13th, and all the conversation with his wife until they came back home. It's correct to say that the food is delicious, but when the police ask Mr. Back for the conversation with his wife in the morning, he is suddenly talking only about his side of the story. It wasn't just conversation was going back and forth. There was only Mr. Back's story. After breakfast, I saw her watching TV in the living room. Is it about someone he doesn't know at all? If you describe the morning as a newlywed, it will be detailed like, I gave good morning kiss to my wife and we cooked breakfast together and ate it. My wife was laughing while watching TV. I joined her and we laughed together. But his statement had no such detail. Mr. Beck also said, after a shower, I wore a white hoodie and black training pants. His wife doesn't appear in any of his statements. And Mr. Beck said his wife said bye-bye and waved her hand in the master bedroom. There is no statement about describe her appearance. The details of his statement before the incident and after the incident are entirely different. Not only this, something else was strange. If you hear this far, you might think, she was three weeks before giving birth to her baby, and she was not preparing to go working until her husband left the house. 
then the wife, the victim, was a full-time housewife. No, the victim was working as an English kindergarten teacher in South Korea, and that kindergarten is a one-hour drive from her house. When her husband left the house at 6.41 a.m., she should probably finish her preparations and go out, because she has to go out at 7 o'clock and arrive at 8 o'clock. However, it would be strange to remember the appearance of the victim that we heard earlier. Four things are weird. Firstly, she was wearing pajamas. Secondly, she did not wash. Thirdly, she didn't do makeup. Last but not least, she did not wear her contact lenses. Then, she didn't prepare anything to go to work until 6.41 a.m. And according to the surveillance camera records before the incident, the victim always left the building at 7 o'clock. Is it because she prepares in 10 minutes? No. According to her family and colleagues' statements, the English kindergarten teacher should be neat and tidy to meet the parents. So it took quite a long time to make up and prepare. Now we know this is conflicting with Mr. Beck's statement for the temporal match. Obviously, the police also felt weird hearing this statement. And Mr. Beck, the victim's husband, did not show any sadness. It was also very strange. The police observed a strange thing from Mr. Beck. When Beck turns his hair over, he sees a V-shaped wound on his forehead. The detectives asked him, why is there a scar on your forehead? Would you please roll up your sleeves for a second and show your arms? When he rolled his sleeves, the detectives saw wounds on his arm. The police asked, what are these scars? Mr. Beck answered, those are just small wounds in the past. But it seemed like those wounds looked relatively fresh to judge as a scar. So the police asked why he was scratched several times. I used to scratch myself, so I scratched and hurt myself. The wound on the left side of the forehead was quite a large wound, with a width of 1 centimeter and a length of 0.5 centimeters. Also, the wound on the left forearm was large enough to lose some flesh, and there were nine scratches on both arms. Also, there were wounds at the temple on the right side, under the ears, and on the cheeks. The detectives start to have doubt when they saw the wounds, and they took pictures of all the wounds of Mr. Beck. But afterward, Mr. Beck's lawyer says, I saw the wounds, but those were almost healed. He is right. Look at the pictures. Those are not fresh wounds. It was a bit healed, but those photos were taken two days after the incident. This reminds us of our first episode, Riddle of Missing Wrists. It's very ambiguous to see that those wounds were healed quite a bit for two days. But the police continued to doubt. The direction of the wounds was also strange, because to make the exact same wounds, Mr. Beck has to twist his hand until his wrist gets hurt. Look at the wound. The angle and direction can't be made by scratching himself. He also said that the scar on his head is a scratch on the shelf. All his wounds were judged to be made almost at the same time. If you had a significant surgery, you might know a medical gel called Contractubex Gel applied over a laparoscope. This is a medical gel that accelerates the healing speed three times for the wounds that have just been formed. Maybe you could think that I have exaggerated its healing speed, but not at all. It heals really fast. These days, it's like Mederma Advanced Scar Gel, of course, this is just speculation that Mr. Beck used this medical gel to heal himself to cover his tracks. However, it was strange to say that all the wounds occurred simultaneously, and that the causes of the simultaneous wound were all different. This wound is scratched on the shelf, this is a wound while doing something, this is just a scratch. So we could speculate its kind of staging on when he got those wounds, but it doesn't end here. The victim's parents speak a bizarre story. Before 9 a.m. on the day of the incident, while Mr. Beck was heading to the library, he called his wife's mother. At first he talked about his exams, and then he suddenly says something like this. I also call my wife from around 4 o'clock. Even if you call me today, it won't work until 4 o'clock. There's no probability. The son-in-law, who had never made a phone call in the usual, made a phone call saying he will not be available until 4 p.m. on the day her daughter died. 
but she thought maybe he needs concentration and understands his words. But suddenly, she got a phone call. It was from the kindergarten and told her that the victim, Mrs. Pock, didn't show up at work. She had a bad feeling about this, so she kept calling her daughter. But as she wasn't answering the phone, she kept calling her son-in-law. But her son-in-law did not answer all the 45 phone calls. At 4.46 p.m., Mr. Back's mother-in-law sends a text message about worrying her daughter. After that text message, Mr. Back called her right away. As soon as Mr. Back answered the phone, he said he just came into the library and saw the message. So the mother-in-law told Mr. Back that, my child didn't go to work and couldn't get in touch. Go back to home quickly and see what happened. That's why he was recorded on surveillance camera at 5.11 p.m. on his studio elevator. According to Mr. Back's lawyer, he said this. The reason he didn't answer the cell phone is that he studied intensively. That's why he checked only the business cell phone provided by the hospital. And he didn't even check the personal cell phones. On the screen, we can see Mr. Back is wearing a muffler. The lawyer also said that as Mr. Back wrapped his cell phone with the muffler and put it in the bag, he did not know there were phone calls. Detectives checked his alibi and he was telling the truth. He was studying in the library. Let's speculate that Mr. Back's phone call to his mother-in-law is somewhat related to this crime. Let's think about why he suddenly called his mother-in-law. It's a message. It's not a big deal that her daughter will not be available until 4 p.m. Because if she visits Mr. Back's house in doubt, there is a high chance that her parents will find the deceased wife, not himself. That's the problem. Why Mr. Back called her on the day of the incident and left those words? Is it just a coincidence? Also, there are weird scenes in this surveillance camera footage. Mr. Back is looking at his head in the mirror on his way to the hospital. He is checking the wound on his forehead. And of course, it's a typical situation because he is going to work. But on the CCTV way back home, he does different behavior. He is wearing very thick clothes, but after raising his arms all the way, he looks at his wound. This is weird because he got a call that his wife suddenly lost contact, and he is going back home because of that. Considering that situation, we can't see any anxiety or worry in his gestures. Everyone, what will you do when you realize your wife or husband didn't show up at work and lost contact? You will call your wife like crazy while going back home as fast as you can. There is one other thing that we should think about. The muffler. Mr. Back said that he wrapped his phone in a muffler and put it in a bag. This is not a universal behavior. His wife is three weeks before childbirth. Judging by common sense, Mr. Back is a doctor and he knows better than us that the child could come out sooner than expected. Therefore, it is rational to think that he must stand by at any time for his wife's emergency call. But look at the footage. He wasn't doing that at all. Anyhow, the police are now asking the victim's husband to consent to the autopsy. But the husband takes a weird stance. He said, it was an accidental death and there is a fetus in the stomach, so it would be better not to do an autopsy. This is where the husband, Mr. Beck, is becoming more suspicious. So the police decided to proceed with an autopsy without her husband's consent. Now, I have to tell you about the autopsy of the body. The autopsy was performed under the guidance of a medical examiner. But there was no noticeable situation for you. Mr. Beck said that there was a problem with the thyroid gland. But there was no problem with a thyroid-related disease at the autopsy. Also, the fetus's condition was confirmed to be healthy until death, and no poison, drugs, alcohol, or anything else was confirmed in the body. There are five wounds on the head and 1.5 centimeter long wounds on the back of the head. There were some bruises on the limbs. Everyone, I need you to focus on this part. There was a wound on the side of the eye and bleeding marks to the left side. When the police arrived, the victim's neck was bent to the right. Anyone who watched episode 3, The Phantom Fencer, will find something is not correct. When the victim died, the neck was bent to the left, so the blood around the eyes flowed to the left. 
which is evidence that someone touched the body after the victim died. In other words, it became evidence of the murder. Another thing that stood out was the airway inside the neck. Internal bleeding is confirmed in the airways. In other words, it's an expression that she died due to the concentration of tremendous power in her neck. It also appears on the autopsy report. It comes out as asphyxiation caused by neck pressure. That is to say, the cause of death is asphyxia. Now, another massive piece of evidence is confirmed. It was the victim's nails. Skin tissue comes out of the victim's fingernails. If the skin tissue is not the victim's, it is most likely the perpetrator. After examining the DNA, the skin tissue was from her husband, Mr. Beck. The detectives are suspicious about Mr. Beck. They think there is a high chance that they fought and made wounds to each other, and the victim died because of it. However, Mr. Beck's lawyers have completely different interpretation of these police interrogations. They say the skin tissue was on the victim's nails because Mr. Beck asked her to scratch his back the night before, so she scratched Mr. Beck's back. This is the skin tissue that came out then. Because it was not blood stain but skin tissue, they defended it in this way. And the lawyers defended the asphyxiation by neck compression. She fainted and collapsed, and her neck was completely bent, tilted to the front side. She died while having difficulties breathing in this pose. Because the wife was a pregnant woman in this position, all the weight, including the child and amniotic fluid, is shifted towards her neck. Because of the pressure, there is also subcutaneous bleeding from the inside, and that's why she died. Everyone with the same autopsy report, the lawyer's and police's interpretation is entirely different. What's frustrating is that when the subcutaneous tissue was detected under the victim's nails, the detectives did not wait until CSI finds out more information. They just rushed to Mr. Back and told him, We now have crucial evidence. Confess, Mr. Back. But the lawyers are consist of a former judge, prosecutor, and their investigators are former detectives. They legally confute that part with a blink of an eye. The detectives requested a precision autopsy to the CSI and waited for the results, especially the estimated time of death. Precision autopsy report confirms that the victim died before Mr. Back's going out. Then Mr. Back is the perpetrator, case closed. Now CSI checks the time of death. They check rigor mortis, liver mortis, rectal temperature, body temperature, digestion of food in the stomach, and clothes, and even check CCTV. The victim's last moment on the CCTV was on January 13th at 6 p.m. Since then, the victim has never been outside, as she was not recorded on surveillance cameras. The estimated time of death ranges from 6 p.m. on the day before the incident to 7 a.m. on the incident. In other words, if it was a murder after the husband came out at 6.40 a.m., the perpetrator committed the crime within 20 minutes until 7 a.m. If it's an accidental death, she fell while preparing to wash within 20 minutes. These two are the CSI's conclusions. The reason why CSI concluded the victim died between those 13 hours is based on many grounds. Firstly, she was wearing sleeping pants, since she entered the house and wore it, and she didn't change her clothes to go to work. Secondly, she was not wearing contact lenses. She looks natural before going to work. Thirdly, it's about rigor mortis, liver mortis, rectal temperature, body temperature. Unfortunately, it was winter, and the victim was pregnant. She set the heating system to maintain a warm temperature. Everyone, the rigor mortis, liver mortis, rectal temperature, and body temperature are directly related to the room temperature. So it became a very ambiguous part of this. Fourthly, digestion of food in the stomach. Nothing. So it's rational to conclude that the victim ate nothing after the last dinner. Therefore, the estimated time of death was no evidence against Mr. Back. So now the detectives come to think of Mr. Back's motive. And there was only one motive. The victim hated her husband playing games every day while he was preparing for the professional doctor's exam. 
It is confirmed that on the day of the incident, Mr. Back played the game until 3 a.m. While Mr. Back was playing games, he said, It's okay, the acceptance rate is over 90%. It's okay. Maybe they had a couple fight because of that. Now, the prosecution and police were preparing to conduct an arrest investigation, but the court rejected it. The reason was that the probability of accidental death cannot be ruled out, so there was room for dispute. After the arrest warrant was rejected, evidence comes out one by one. As the first evidence, the stand in the master bedroom. This is considered circumstantial evidence of the couple's fight. The second piece of evidence was blood-stained clothes and blankets hidden on the cabinet in the master bedroom. The police didn't find it on the initial investigation, but when the arrest warrant was rejected, they became desperate. So they looked at the crime scene again and found it. If the blood was the victim's, it is rational to think there was an assault here. As soon as they found the evidence, they asked Mr. Back to submit a lie detector test. Everyone, when somebody does a lie detector test, there is something called an emotional reaction. The graph is not calm, it makes fluctuation. In a situation where the husband, the prime suspect, stubbornly denies the crime, emotional reactions to the place of the crime are strong. And when the police ask the places of the crime in the order of the bathroom, the living room, and the bedroom, the emotional fluctuation is confirmed in the bedroom. Several circumstantial pieces of evidence have been gathered, even if it is just circumstantial evidence. But if there is no contradiction between those circumstantial pieces of evidence, consistent and concrete enough, then it can be accepted as evidence. The detectives immediately reclaim the warrant, but the lawyers say the stand was broken before the crime, and the blood marks are made because the victim was a pregnant woman. It's because of frequent nosebleeds due to the pregnancy. And the husband, Mr. Back, also stated that his wife had frequent nosebleeds. This part was also not properly accepted for the adoption of evidence. Again, the detectives should not request a warrant as soon as they found bloodstain, but asked CSI for further examination. Like in our episode, The Case of Phantom Fencer, the shape of the bloodstain, spatter, and elongation are extremely important. But regrettably, they did not do it. And the lawyers caught the flaw and quickly defended it. The lawyers said that it's a daily bloodstain. As for the statement about why Mr. Back put the bloodstained clothes on the closet, lawyers said it's bloody anyway, so Mr. Back was going to throw it away later. It doesn't end here. About Mr. Back's wounds, the lawyers brought statements from his colleagues to prove that he has a habit of scratching himself and is often wounded because of that. Great lawyers. So far, they have hammered everything that the police insist. Then some of you might think the husband is really innocent. It looks like an accidental death. Now then, it was the next important part. Now the prosecutor takes the case and begins to investigate a little bit deeper. Look at the victim's pose. If this is an accidental death, there is a problem. If the victim felt dizzy, there is a high chance that she made some kind of defensive behavior before losing her consciousness. Before she passed out, she could use her hand to support her body, but we can see nothing like that, which means she passed out instantly. That's how the blood vessels are blocked. Breathing stops, and she passed away. And Mr. Back's lawyers brought a thesis to support Mr. Back's claim an unusual accidental death from positional asphyxia. This thesis presents real cases of asphyxia with unusual poses. Like we handled in our episode, Riddle of Missing Wrists and Minority Report, after asphyxia due to neck compression, there must be marks of hand or mark of something that pressed the neck. But according to this thesis, there are actual cases of accidental death caused by strange pose, just fainted by herself and passed away. And for this part, the prosecutor was surprised. This thesis was so professional. When the prosecution cannot refute that part, the prosecution thoroughly checked files presented by the lawyers and finds out one flaw. Death by choking is always accompanied by congestion, 
and petechia in the pupil. It means that if accidental death occurs due to fainting, congestion cannot occur. However, if she fainted instantly, there is always something in common. It's drugs and alcohol. This means that accidental death is possible only when she is utterly intoxicated with drugs or alcohol and completely unconscious. But obviously, there was no drug or alcohol as a result of the autopsy. And the forensic scientists who have confirmed this also say, this is a pose created by an external force. Someone moved the victim's body into a pose like that. It is a story that she was not in a natural pose. At this time, the second precision autopsy report comes out. Obviously, she was asphyxiated by neck pressure. So, the CSI cut every layer of the epidermis to see if it was pressed against the neck or not. After dividing all the epidermis into subdivision and checked where the bleeding was clustered and draw on the bleeding lump, they can't find it with a visual inspection. But the blood vessels in the subcutaneous layer have ruptured and there was the final conclusion. There is severe bleeding inside the victim's neck. It is decided that the cause of death as asphyxia due to neck compression caused by a hand. In easy words, if you press the neck hard, marks will appear on the skin's surface. But if someone presses the neck with a thick pillow, there will be no marks on the appearance. But the mark will appear on the inside of the skin. That's how the medical examiners come to a forensic conclusion about how she died. In the context of forensic judgment, this is a murder case. Now the police and the prosecution request an arrest warrant again. But the lawyers immediately change their perspective that someone else entered the 22nd floor and committed this crime between 6.40 a.m. and 7 a.m. In those words, they defend their client, Mr. Back. In addition, when the prosecutor requested the arrest warrant again, one more CCTV was submitted as evidence. The footage was proof that Mr. Back lied about his cell phone. We remember Mr. Back said, because I was studying for a test, I wrapped my mobile phone in a muffler and put it in my bag so I couldn't check any phone calls. According to the CCTV in the diner where Mr. Back had lunch, he wore a muffler around his neck. It means that he had unwrapped the muffler. Then it means that he saw the cell phone and checked 45 calls that came from his mother-in-law and he didn't call back. Of course, he doesn't have to, but he has 45 missed calls and his wife is full term. He must felt that something emergency happened, but he was in peace, eating lunch and did nothing. It doesn't make sense, but for the lawyers, that was just circumstantial evidence, nothing more. They defended Mr. Beck quickly. Now all these parts are prosecuted and now the trial begins. At the first trial, Mr. Back's lawyers invited Canadian forensic scientist, Dr. Michael Sven Pullinen. He was director of the Forensic Medicine Center of the Toronto University. I will be in attendance on July 23rd. There was a reason for inviting this person at a tremendous cost, including round trip airfare, all the cost of his stay and rewards. Forensic Dr. Pullinen is the one who wrote the thesis on the strange posture of asphyxiation that I mentioned earlier. As counter, the prosecution requested forensic doctor Yoon Sung Lee of Seoul National University as a witness. There, Dr. Pollinen says, the posture of Mrs. Pack's body is the same as that of the abnormal posture asphyxia that I studied so far. She couldn't breathe with the neck bent after she fell, and that was the cause of death. However, Professor Yoon Sung Lee of the prosecutor's office insists when I checked each and every layer of the neck epidermis, this is absolutely not the category that can come out when the head is bent. It's longer and bigger. It comes out when someone presses it. It's about the same size as the length of both hands. It's hard to say that it came out because the neck was bent. Also, what Dr. Pollinen claims is only possible when the victim is heavily intoxicated with drugs or alcohol. But in the autopsy report, there was nothing. After trial, Mr. Back was guilty of the murder charge and sentenced to 20 years in prison. In the US, if someone kills a woman knowing that she is pregnant, 
and the mother and the baby all passed away, then he will be charged with double homicide. But in South Korea, there is no such law. Mr. Back knew she had their baby. He was not punished for what he did to his own baby. Do you think this is right? What do you think?